Section 1 of Scholasticism, a lecture delivered before the University of Oxford by Walter Waddington Shirley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scholasticism, Part 1 If anyone should desire to measure the force of the revolution in opinion, taste, and feeling which separates us from the last century, he could hardly perhaps do so more simply than by comparing the estimate formed of the Middle Ages by the best writers of a hundred years ago with that which is now current among ourselves. Viewed from our present standing point, the account of the Middle Ages given by an historian like Robertson is not so much inadequate as simply and purely entertaining. We read it almost as we should read the travels of a Chinaman in Europe, for the delightful naivete of its remarks, for the pleasure of observing the effect produced by a new society on the mind of a total stranger, and for the odd contrast between occasional penetration and acuteness and the profound ignorance which the work as a whole reveals. To Robertson, modern history began with Charles V, and Robertson faithfully represents the public opinion of his day. Of the other side of the picture I need scarcely stop to remind you. The prominence of medievalism in art, in literature, in opinion, is among the most patent facts of the day. And this reaction of feeling, which has drawn us of late years so strongly towards the Middle Ages, is but one phase of the transformation which has passed upon Europe as a whole, and of which we often speak, not very accurately, as the working out of the great French Revolution. The truth is, perhaps, rather, that the French Revolution itself is but the most striking expression of a movement which has brought into vogue a new cycle of ideas, and has cast discredit upon principles which from the sixteenth century downwards had been accepted as the basis of society. It cannot therefore be surprising that the generation which arose after the French Revolution should have turned instinctively to the annals of an earlier time. If the maxims of the sixteenth century were to be no longer accepted as a law, if the structure of European society, the framework of European politics which dated from that great epoch, were at last to be questioned, shaken, and in great part destroyed, what enquiry so natural as one which would reveal the state of society before the sixteenth century had inaugurated a new order of things? But it is not only the chronological position of the Middle Ages, as coming immediately before the sixteenth century, which makes them of especial interest to us, an age which has made it its peculiar work to recast for living use every institution on which the rust of the past had gathered, must turn with peculiar interest to the annals of a time when an earlier civilization worked out upon its own soil the problem of a free government, and evolved out of the chaos of early feudalism the great principles of order, of nationality, and of law. From an ecclesiastical point of view, moreover, the Middle Ages have an especial interest for us who have seen the results of the Reformation brought front to front for the first time with a new order of ideas which does not derive from the sixteenth century, and which owes no homage to the Reformers. Cast upon such a time, our choice at least is clear. An appeal to the sixteenth century will avail us but little now. We must cast ourselves in a larger and more Catholic spirit on the past, or we must move under new lights into an unseen and shadowy future. And therefore, of the whole past, excepting always the very earliest ages of the Church, the so-called Middle Ages are to the ecclesiastical historian at this hour the most full of interest. For the Church of the Middle Ages, while it was far enough removed from the apostolic type, was yet untouched by the rude hand of revolution. It had grown with a continuous growth, it had learnt to adapt itself, with even a fatal flexibility, to the society in which it had been planted, and it has become to us, with all its faults, perhaps the most marvellous instance which the course of history affords of the power of the Church to adapt herself to a state of society the most opposite to that for which she was originally formed. But in truth, whatever our point of view, from whatever side we regard the intellectual life of our day, we shall be at no loss to assign reasons why the Middle Ages should at this hour be attracting a share of attention which they have never yet attracted since they fell themselves, spent in power and weighted with corruption, before the forces of a younger world. What is really surprising is that all that has of late been thought and said and written on the subject of the Middle Ages should have availed so little to make us really familiar with medieval modes of thought. It is still true, notwithstanding all that has been done of late years, that upon the very ground on which we stand, in the very university of which we are members, there was acted out a most remarkable chapter in the history of the human mind, and that we know next to nothing of it. 
We have learnt indeed to recognize at a glance the grotesque energy, the playful waywardness, the grim independence of medieval art. We have learnt, at least some of us, the bold outlines of medieval history, and some of its chief actors are cherished by us with a veneration as familiar as belongs to any historic names. But of the great stream of medieval thought, of that which underlies the history and finds a partial expression in the art of the Middle Ages, we are still strangely ignorant. We have still no history of medieval literature as a whole, and the best history of the scholastic philosophy itself is written with the pert self-assurance of a prize man of the French Academy. The history of medieval thought is, in short, a subject in which many feel an interest on which few can claim to be informed. And this circumstance may, I hope, excuse me for bringing before you, in a somewhat more public manner, a few remarks which I should naturally have made to the attendants on my private lectures, now that I am entering with them on the study of the medieval history of the English Church. That a vast amount of intellectual activity existed in the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries, no one can question who has cast the most casual glance upon the literary records of the time. The mere fact, so amply evidenced, that 30,000 students were once congregated within the walls of this very university town, and congregated, it would seem, for the most part, not with the hope of a degree, and of consequent privilege and advancement, but simply in order to acquire the current learning of the day. This fact, which is but the repetition of one which was common to all the great medieval universities, may suffice to show how widely the thirst of learning was diffused, in spite of the general rudeness of a society in which it was a rare accomplishment for a lay noble to be able to sign his name. Nor was this intellectual activity of the kind which seems, in our own day, most naturally to spring up wherever civilized society establishes itself upon a new soil. It was not the impatience to acquire useful knowledge, which diffuses a shallow education over the largest possible area. It was, at least to many men, an awakening to intellectual life, and a craving for a solution of some of the deepest problems that can be presented to the human mind. Those vast tomes of the schoolmen, which we regard with so distant a respect, not only bespeak an amount of literary toil rare in the most cultivated times, but give evidence of a precision of thought and of a subtlety of logical analysis which may challenge a comparison with the best works of the best ages of philosophy. Yet no one can take up, even in the most cursory manner, a volume of some great schoolman, without being aware that if it exhibits intellectual qualities of no common order, it seems separated from the rest of literature by some impassable barrier. It may be curious, it may be acute, it may be even wonderful as an effort of the human mind, but it is impossible somehow to bring ourselves into harmony with it. We seem almost at times to be reading the philosophy of another race of beings. In speaking thus, I am of course describing the sensations produced upon one of us on taking up for the first time a volume, for instance, of that most medieval of all medieval writers, the subtle doctor, Duns Scotus and partly, no doubt, the impression it produces is simply that which is produced upon anyone who takes up for the first time an entirely new subject. But yet, after all allowance, it is, I think, clear to every one that the writings of the schoolmen are distinguished by marked and peculiar features from every other literature with which we are at all familiar. To the question, in what this peculiarity consists, I shall venture today to attempt a partial answer and it is one which I believe is best considered by a reference to the circumstances under which medieval letters rose. Hauro, in his History of the Scholastic Philosophy, discusses, not unnaturally, at some length, the question, what is scholastic philosophy? And he comes to the conclusion that no better definition can be given than that scholastic philosophy is the philosophy which was taught in the schools. This reminds one certainly of the kindred definition of a modern poet, that poetry is verse. It sounds, in short, like a definition of the thing by its accidents. And yet, when we come to examine the facts by the light of history, we see that there is really more in it than at first sight appears. Logically, the definition may be poor enough, but it points to an historical fact which contains the key to the very peculiarities of the scholastic philosophy which it might be hard to embrace in the limits of a rigorous definition. Scholastic philosophy is, in fact, the philosophy of the scholai. In other words, the philosophy which created the universities of Europe, which was fostered in turn by the universities, and which found in the universities its most enduring stronghold. When the empire of the West was broken up by the establishment of the barbarian kingdoms, almost the first act of the conquerors, when once fairly established on the soil of their new land, 
was to adopt the religion and, with it, some portion of the civilization of the conquered. But the difficulty of which we have had such large experience in modern times, of engrafting upon the habits of a young and half-barbarous race the manners, the mode of life, the education, the whole civilization, in short, of an ancient and cultivated people, was felt also in the new kingdoms which planted themselves on the fallen empire. It was found then, as it has been found since, that the abrupt introduction of a high culture and a gentle life among a people accustomed but yesterday to the forest and to the sword, enervates the barbarian without civilizing the man, and that nations whose misfortune it has been to be thus prematurely forced have borne for a while the glitter of their mimic triumphs, and have then sunk forever. It was, of course, on the first wave of the conquerors that these unhappy influences told in all their force. The Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Burgundians romanized in all externals more rapidly than those who followed them. They became Christians also more early, but they became Arians. In both cases, the secular and the religious, the same deep-planted weakness was in fault. They did not assimilate the life they copied. The external form was there, the outward polish of the old Roman world, the polity and the ritual of a church, but the vital energy was deficient. They had caught the spirit neither of the Roman nor the Christian life. They perished from the face of Europe, but they had done the work of tempering and adapting the Roman civilization more nearly to the wants of the rude tribes who attempted to make it their inheritance. The Catholic Frank, when he subdued the Burgundian and the Visigoth, became less Roman than either, but what he did adopt from the older world he made more thoroughly his own. Yet even here the depressing influence of the traditions of an older world was felt. The Frank and the Saxon knew no modes of government but those of the forest and the forum. The first had come simply to an end, by the mere force of circumstances, when they exchanged their half-nomad life for the government of an old and settled country. On the second, therefore, on the old Roman law and the old imperial traditions, they attempted to build their polity. It was, of course, in many essential respects wholly unsuited to their circumstances, and hence their repeated failures to establish a lasting government. Until at last, in the ninth and tenth centuries, the empire of Charlemagne, broken into a hundred fragments, crystallized itself anew, as it were, on the pure feudal type, and a new society sprang into being, no longer encumbered with unwieldy and impracticable traditions, but yet deriving from the imperial past just so much as it was able healthily to employ, without cramping its energies and fettering its own free movement. In recapitulating these facts, I have seemed, probably, to deviate from my proper subject. But in fact, such an outline of the history of the body politic is necessary to an understanding of the intellectual history of the time. The one is almost a precise counterpart of the other. In literature, as in politics, three chief periods are to be plainly distinguished from each other. In the first, of which a man like Sidonius Apollinaris is perhaps a fair expression, everything is cast in the mold of the lower empire, cultivated, affected, feeble to the last degree. In the second, which is represented by such men as Gregory the Great, as Bede and Alcuin and Erugina, the basis of all learning is still the same. The same writers are studied, the same authorities as a whole are appealed to. But there are traces withal that in times of comparative quiet the influence of the East had told. The fathers, too, had inspired a taste for the study of Neoplatonism, and it was through this channel that the daring speculations of Erugina arose to startle an age which was unable either to emulate or to answer them. But, speaking more generally, there is a freedom of handling unknown to the earlier time. The writing is more simple, the thought more true and just, and men here and there are found, like Alcuin, to declare that the science of sciences is philosophy, a sentiment which in the fifth century would have simply been impossible, and which seems to be prophetic of the great philosophical movement which was to follow. Nevertheless, the intellectual movement of this second period, which culminates in the court of Charlemagne, itself shared the fate of Charlemagne's political fabric. In the close of the ninth and the beginning of the tenth century, a dense darkness seems to have settled more than once on the mind of Western Europe, and when it is removed we find ourselves in the light of a new day. We find that new intellectual impulses are at work, which are destined before long to effect a revolution as remarkable as any which the history of the human mind records. The controversy of La Franque with Berengar on the subject of the Blessed Eucharist has justly been considered to mark the opening of the new period. La Franque marks his own sense of the unusual mode in which Berengar had conducted the controversy when he reproaches him with desiring, quote, 
relictis sacris auctoritatibus ad dialecticam confugium facere, close quote. But he follows himself in the same steps. He no longer attempts, like a theologian of the previous period, to bear down his adversary with the dead weight of authority, but he answers dialectic with dialectic, and argues a point of theology upon the basis of pure reason. What Lanfranc had done reluctantly, and as it were by accident, his disciple Anselm did with the whole soul of a philosopher, and from that time the scholastic philosophy took firm root in Europe. The transformation which thus passed on the intellectual education of the Western world is one of which it is scarcely possible to exaggerate the magnitude. It was an exchange of education by a dead literature for education by a living philosophy. In the mere externals of teaching, the revolution was visible to the whole world. The old cathedral and monastic schools, valuable for their store of manuscripts and capable at the worst of affording a plain instruction in grammar, were deserted for the new schools which, under the name of universities, arose in Italy and France and England. If the study of the day was to be not the ancient authors but a living philosophy, the primary need was not an ample store of manuscripts but the last and most celebrated teacher. Therefore it became necessary that students, instead of being scattered among the numerous monastic and cathedral schools, should be assembled at a few great centers where the greatest possible number of pupils could have access to the lessons of the few men who had caught the ear of their day and could advance the science which they taught. A corresponding necessity pressed upon the teachers themselves. Anselm himself, at Beck, found it almost impossible to receive the numbers who came to him for instruction. In the next generation, a teacher of Anselm's celebrity would have been driven perforce to the new University of Paris, where alone at that time accommodation could be found for the growing concourse of students. The mere fact that the education of Europe thus came to be conducted at a few great centers of learning must in itself have had an incalculable effect in awakening a new intellectual life, in giving current to the interchange of ideas, and in strengthening that sense of unity of which the Church was the highest expression, but which had been grievously impaired by the calamities of the two preceding centuries. But the change was a far deeper one than is implied in this external alteration. Among all the various kinds of education which have ever been employed, two have, as a matter of fact, enjoyed a clear preeminence. I mean education by language and education by philosophy. It was between these two that the struggle lay in that revival of learning which I have coupled with the names of Lanfranc and Anselm. The traditions of the past were, on the whole, in favor of language. The impetus of the new movement had come from philosophy. Yet the study of the Latin language received a new stimulus, and the Latin, perhaps, of Malmesbury, certainly of John of Salisbury, is superior to anything which can be quoted through the long tract of a thousand years which elapsed between the fall of the Western Empire and the revival of classical letters. But the stimulus was simply indirect, derived at second hand from the genuine awakening of philosophical enquiry and when two generations had passed, the study of language was found to decline again with a rapidity which seemed to keep pace with the advancing strides of philosophy. At last, in the thirteenth century, in the golden age of scholasticism, it was found necessary to decree, within this very university, that the man who maintained that ego curit was good grammar should be deprived of his master's gown. And, in fact, it is easy to see that if the intellectual movement of that day was only healthy and vigorous, no other termination of the struggle was really possible. All nations, so far as I know, who have ever achieved a really great literature, have passed at one time or another through a course of philosophical training. It was on philosophy that Athens was formed. It was through philosophy that Rome achieved success in the only department of literature where she reigns original and supreme. Arabia, India, and even China, I presume, bear witness to the same great law, that without a philosophical training, no nation has ever yet attained to a high and lasting eminence in the world of letters. And there is a sufficiently obvious reason why the study of philosophy should be better adapted, as a general rule, than the study of language to an early stage in the intellectual career of a nation. Language, in fact, imparts its higher lessons by an indirect teaching, and so far as it calls out the higher reasoning powers, it does so by appealing to a fine sense of difference, to a certain delicacy of analysis, which presupposes a rather wide reading and a cultivation of general taste. And this may often fail to be found in societies where, on the other hand, there is great intellectual energy and perhaps an impetuous impatience of small and delicate results. Philosophy, on the contrary, goes directly to her point, and confronts the intellect, very early in its training, 
with the great problems upon which the mind of man has ever bent with the most absorbing gaze. To the strong, irregular impetuosity of the Middle Ages, such a study had charms which were irresistible, and it brought with it at the same time a discipline but for which the awakened intellect of Europe might to all appearances have dwindled away into the sickly gracefulness of the troubadour. Thus, then, the victory fell to the side of philosophy, and the victory, once gained, was no transient or partial triumph. Through two eventful centuries, which witnessed as they passed, the formation of nationalities, the establishment of representative government, the birth of vernacular literature, and the grand climacteric of ecclesiastical power, the philosophy of the schools held on its way, not only commanding with an undisputed sway the intellect of those restless times, but elaborating its system, extending its influence, and drawing into its service some of the highest minds that the Christian world has produced. For two centuries longer, though spent in vital energy, it continued to rule on, till with the fifteenth century came the resistless onslaught, which with the revival of classical letters broke forever the spell of its dominion. End of Part 1 Section 2 of Scholasticism by Walter Waddington Shirley this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Scholasticism, Part 2 We return to the question, what was the scholastic philosophy? We have seen that, as a matter of history, it was the philosophy which arose among the nations of Western Christendom when they had so far thrown off the weight which the traditions of imperial Rome had imposed as to be able to think for themselves without feeling at every moment bowed down by the weight of an authority which they dared not gainsay. We have seen also that the introduction of this philosophy was a great intellectual revolution, involving a fundamental change in the system of mental training then prevalent, by which the discipline of a living school of thought was substituted for the dry and tasteless study of the writers of the lower empire. But in order to appreciate the magnitude of the change effected, it must be borne in mind that it was but the educational and learned phase of a yet wider movement, which consisted in so far throwing off the traditions of ancient Rome, as to build up, with the bold hand of freedom, an entirely new form of government, to establish new relations between the various kingdoms which still owned a shadowy allegiance to the empire, and to express the new forms of national life in a new school of art, and before long in a new and vernacular literature. And in every case the great primary condition by which these changes are governed, that which has made them possible at all, that which governs their direction when made, is this, that the authority of ancient tradition has been just so far thrown off as to make the free movement possible. In politics, for example, men no longer attempt, as under the rule of the Visigoths, to keep up the old Roman magistracies, and to govern a new society with all the machinery of an old. They no longer attempt, like Charlemagne, to restore the old empire in its completeness, trusting by altered modes of administration to adapt it to modern uses. They have learnt a bolder course. They form for themselves a polity in which much may be traced to Rome, but of which the leading principles are essentially their own, the expression of their own wants and of their own political ideas. In philosophy it is just the same, and the school of Alcuin is in precisely the same stage of half-emancipation from the past as is the government of his imperial master. But there is another aspect of the condition which it is essential to bear in mind. Compared with the ages which had preceded it, the emancipation of the eleventh century is a marvel, but the freedom which it enjoyed was relative and not absolute. In the first place, we find that the Middle Ages were profoundly unconscious of the extent to which they had deviated from the past. They reared up the fabric of nationality and bowed all the while, with a vague but respectful homage, before the effete majesty of the empire. Latin was to them the only language in the true sense of the term the only tongue which was worthy to be employed in the service of religion or of science. Yet they created the vernacular literature which supplanted it in the hearts of men. They deemed Roman the only architecture, and while they thought to imitate it, there arose under their hands the clustered shaft and the pointed arch, instinct with the luxuriance of a younger life. They bowed in their philosophy before the ipse dixit of Aristotle, and they studied him until he emerged from their hands half a Platonist and half a father of the church. The freedom of the Middle Ages was thus exercised under a strange unconsciousness of its existence, or at least of its extent. They considered themselves as humbly adapting to their own use the heritage bequeathed to them by the past. 
It is impossible to insist too strongly on the importance of realizing this peculiar condition of things in any attempt to understand the intellectual phenomena of the time. Men contrived by means of it to retain, in the midst of universal innovation, a profound reverence for authority. They looked to authority, therefore, for their premises, and building, as they believed, upon foundations of adamant, became almost fearless as to the conclusions which they might erect upon them, and followed out their thoughts with a hardihood and an exuberant ingenuity of speculation which has perhaps never been surpassed. This, then, is the fundamental character which is impressed on the scholastic philosophy by the conditions under which it rose, viz., that it derives its premises not from self-consciousness, or from any ultimate analysis of the human mind, but absolutely from authority. And yet, when its premises are once given, it operates upon them with a fearlessness proportioned to the unbounded confidence which it places in them. To combine and systematize what it found dispersed, to supply what it found deficient, and reconcile what appeared contradictory, this was the work which it proposed to itself. To originate it deemed beyond its province. And this character of the scholastic philosophy I have ventured to call fundamental, because from it we can immediately derive the most remarkable properties of the system. Throughout this lecture, for example, I have been speaking of scholastic philosophy. It might admit of a doubt whether scholastic theology would not be a more correct expression. So nearly identical were the two subjects to the mind of the Middle Ages. And this intimate union of philosophy with theology, which is perhaps of all facts connected with the subject the most familiar to us, is an immediate consequence of the general position at which we have just now arrived. For, in fact, the sources from which the schoolmen derived their premises were almost entirely theological, and were gathered indeed in great part from the works of the Latin fathers. Anyone who has ever looked at the sentences of Peter the Lombard will the more easily understand my meaning. That celebrated work, as is well known, was long employed as the universal textbook of theology, and was taken by some of the greatest schoolmen as the framework of their own teaching. Yet it is nothing more than a series of extracts from the Latin fathers and the popes, so tessellated together as to construct a system of theology out of the most unsystematic of all possible materials. In this, then, their most popular textbook is fairly exhibited the material upon which the schoolmen delighted to operate. From the fathers, thus collected, they would gather not only a body of theology, but, interwoven with it, a good deal of philosophy, wholly or almost wholly marked with Alexandrian and Platonic influences. But they would look in vain to the fathers for anything approaching to a philosophic method, or even for anything which could properly be described as systematic theology. Yet the whole bent of the scholastic movement led them, as we have seen, to systematize, and they wanted, therefore, not only the matter upon which to work, but a method upon which to proceed. What course they might have taken if they had been compelled to construct from the foundations a new philosophical method, it seems in vain to speculate. Happily for them, they found in the organon of Aristotle the very thing they needed, an unrivaled method, and at the same time so little else, so little of positive philosophical doctrine, that, aided by their reverence for the past, they were able to hide from themselves all discrepancies between Aristotle and the Platonizing fathers, and to make use of the Greek philosopher as their master in the task of constructing a systematic theology. Aristotle became to them thus a kind of supplementary father, and so lofty was the reverence which they conceived for him, that for centuries he was quoted habitually as the philosopher, and among the minor problems of scholastic theology, none was more warmly debated than the question whether the soul of Aristotle had found a place in the limbus patrum, the intermediate abode of the souls of the saints of the older covenant. We see, then, here the reason why, in the hands of the schoolmen, the relations of theology and philosophy should have become more than commonly intimate. For while they derived their method from a heathen philosopher, they applied that method not to their own free thoughts, but almost exclusively to the matter which they had gathered from the works of the Latin fathers. Turning, then, from the method to the matter, we are in a position now to consider the salient points which difference scholastic from patristic theology for we are able to see clearly the essential difference between the personal position of the fathers and that of the schoolmen. The lot of the early church was cast upon days of warm and restless controversy with heathenism or Judaism, opened and avowed, or with suppressed tendencies towards both, venting themselves in the form of heresy. From the first dawn of theology, in the great conflict with Gnosticism down to the time when Latin letters were hushed in the crash of the falling empire, 
generation after generation had been called to contend for some master truth, some element most generally of the great doctrine of the Trinity, which was for the moment the key of the position, and for the maintenance of which the whole forces of the Church had to unite their untiring efforts. The writings of the Fathers, therefore, speaking generally, were penned with an immediate practical object. They are written without system, and so far as the works of any single father possess any inner unity, it is derived from their relation not to any absolute scheme of theology, but to the central question of the day, even though that question might be one which, in the eyes of another generation, would be sure to occupy no more than a secondary place. Each great father, then, speaking broadly, clusters his theology round the critical controversy of his day, and if he is led to make dogmatic statements upon any other point of faith, he does so for the most part incidentally, as, for instance, when some doctrine is appealed to as a motive for Christian conduct, or as indirectly bearing on the subject of the immediate argument. To these circumstances, no doubt, the theology of the fathers owes a part of its preeminence, for it is the theology, so to speak, not of the study, but of the camp. It has in it the din and the fire and the fury of war, but for this very reason it is essentially unsystematic. The position of the schoolmen was as opposite to this as possible. They received the body of doctrine which came down to them from the early church with the implicit faith of children. They asked not to question, but to understand it, not to inquire whether it was true, but to know the relations of the several doctrines to each other, their connection as the parts of one majestic whole. The celebrated maxim of St. Anselm, Credo ut intelligam, might be taken as the motto not of his works alone, but of the whole scholastic theology. Therefore the schoolmen became the founders not so much of a theology as of a theological system. But it will no doubt be urged, the Middle Ages were not marked by any cessation, but rather by the revival of theological controversy, and so unquestionably they were. But if I mistake not, there is a clear and cardinal distinction between the controversies of the Middle Ages and those of the early church. All the great controversies of the early church turned upon a question of fact, whether our blessed Lord did indeed rise with a real body from the dead, whether he was indeed God, equal with the Eternal Father, whether the Holy Ghost was indeed the Lord, whether he spake by the prophets of old, whether he now implants in the heart the necessary germ of grace. Such and such like were the controversies which stirred the church for the first four centuries of its existence. The great controversies of the Middle Ages turned, on the other hand, not upon the facts of the faith, but upon the mode of the divine operation. In the argument between Lafranc and Berengar, which occupied, as we have seen, the opening of the scholastic period, the reality of our blessed Lord's presence in the Eucharist was unchallenged by either party. It was the mode of the divine presence which was alone in dispute. In the next generation, another instance may be found in the great work of St. Anselm upon the purpose of the Incarnation or, as it might be more properly entitled, upon the purpose of our Lord's death upon the cross. The fact that our blessed Lord did by his death take away our sins, and that his sacrifice of himself was in some sense vicarious, is abundantly laid down by the fathers, as indeed it could not fail to be, but of the exact mode in which that sacrifice had operated to effect the work of our redemption, no ancient father had treated, and it was reserved for St. Anselm to take up the suggestions which they had casually let fall, and to work out that theory of the redemption which has from his time downward been most generally received within the Christian Church. A third great question, the doctrine of predestination, will appear, probably, to be a more doubtful instance, and it is worth observing that it is precisely on the confines of the patristic and scholastic periods that it emerges into its chief importance. It is the last patristic, it is the first scholastic controversy for indeed it belongs to the time of Arugina and of Charlemagne, rather than to the purely scholastic times at all. And yet this is in a manner the exception which proves the rule. The theological question, which to St. Augustine was the real point at issue, was the fact of our dependence upon divine grace. The metaphysical point, for which Arugina chiefly cared, is the mode in which the freedom of the human will is to be reconciled with the existence of a personal God. But even if it should be thought that some exceptions to the rule may be detected on the one side or on the other, I am persuaded that the main principle will still stand its ground, that the fathers, namely, contended for the facts upon which the faith is built, the schoolmen for the ulterior questions which arise upon the mode of the divine action. Indeed, a simple comparison between the two great creeds on the one hand, and the general position of the schoolmen on the other, 
will suffice to show that some distinction of the kind must exist between the theology of the two periods. Another point of decided contrast between the fathers and the schoolmen may serve again to show how much explains itself when we have once formed a clear conception of the historical position of the two. By nothing are the early fathers more clearly differenced from each other than by the estimate which they severally formed of the value of philosophy. On the one hand we have Origen and Clement, and the whole school of Alexandria, to whom the Christian was the true Gnostic, and who recognized in the philosophy of Plato a preparation for the coming of Christ, as true in its degree as was the legislation of Moses. On the other we have the quid academiae et ecclesiae of Tertullian, and the stern repudiation of the polluted learning of the world which stamped, we might almost say, the whole church of the West. And in this antagonism there is nothing incidental or superficial. It is one of those contrasts which have their root very deep in human nature. And yet, when we turn to the schoolmen, every trace of it seems to be effaced. It still remains true, no doubt, that there exist the same two classes of minds, those to which a various culture has a value almost priceless, and those to which it is but an ensnaring vanity, or, to speak more justly, a sin without temptation. Yet the severest minds of the age have scarcely a word to say against the dialectical studies of the schools. The marked opposition to philosophy, which we saw in the early church, has utterly died down and disappeared. The explanation of this change is a simple one enough. The philosophy which was known to the early church was derived from pagan sources, and might well seem likely to infuse into the Christian faith the subtle poison of heathenism. The philosophy of the Middle Ages, on the other hand, was wholly and purely Christian, and owed nothing but its method to the literature of the heathen world. To philosophy in itself the church was not opposed, but only to the introduction, under the shelter of philosophy, of the principles of a disguised heathenism. There are, in conclusion, two other points which involve no comparison with the fathers, but which are too characteristic of the schools to be altogether passed over, even in this rapid sketch. The first is the remarkable course which was run by the great controversy between the realists and nominalists. The two parties derived their names from the side which they took in the discussion on the nature of genera and species. Between the extreme views that the individual being was but a copy, more or less imperfect, of some actual celestial archetype, and, on the other hand, that the individual alone was real, and that genera and species were mere names, representing the results of induction, there were several shades of opinion. But it was by their inclination to the one side or to the other that the adherents of the rival schools were distinguished. The controversy was, of course, not a new one. On the one side, had they been more deeply learned, the disputants might have ranged Plato, on the other their master Aristotle, and it is one, moreover, of those imperishable controversies which seem to renew themselves with every great change which passes upon the world of letters. What is remarkable is, not the existence of the controversy, but the singular course which it took. On the first opening of the schools it engaged the foremost combatants. St. Anselm had, indeed, a comparatively easy battle against the crude extravagancies of Rosselin. But in the next generation, St. Bernard met with an antagonist intellectually at the least his equal, in the person of the celebrated Abelard. Yet the triumph of the realists was at once decisive and enduring, and nominalism was heard no more, until, early in the fourteenth century, in the first decay of the schools, it was revived by William of Ockham. What is remarkable is, not only that nominalism met with so little favor, but that all its great maintainers, Rosselin, Abelard, Ockham, were men the tenor of whose lives added no weight to their opinions, and who lay under suspicion of heresy, if not of unbelief. It may no doubt be true that nominalism in its extreme form does lead to materialism, but a conceptualism like that of Abelard, which yet ranked him with the nominalists, is substantially the philosophical creed which in modern times has met with the most large acceptance, and which certainly has not entailed upon its holders the taint or the suspicion of heresy. It seems clear, then, that there was something peculiar in the condition of the times which gave a decided advantage to the opinions of the opposite school. 1. In the first place, let me remind you of the fact, which I fear you will be tired of hearing, that at least in the earlier stages of scholasticism, the method alone was from Aristotle, the matter almost wholly from the fathers, and that the philosophy of the fathers was in the main platonic. The conclusions of the realists were therefore half implied in the premises to which both parties appealed. The cause of the nominalists must have been strong indeed to have prevailed at such a disadvantage. By the fourteenth century, however, 
men had become aware of the real opinions of Aristotle, and so the balance of authority was to a great extent redressed, and the field was thus prepared for a revived school of nominalists. 2. But in the second place it must be borne in mind that in an age in which historical criticism is unknown, a most exaggerated importance is sure to attach to anything in the nature of an a priori evidence of the truths of the Christian religion. This realism could offer, and nominalism could not. For nominalism begins and ends in an analysis of the human mind, and is equally complete whether there be a god or no. To realism the existence of a god is a philosophical postulate. The last characteristic of the scholastic learning which I propose very briefly to notice is its ingrained hostility to criticism, especially of an historical kind. The evidence of this hostility abounds on every hand. We read it unmistakably, for instance, in the ready acceptance of the fable of Brute the Trojan or of the forged decretals of Isidore, and more broadly in the fact that from the time of Malmesbury no historian, in the modern sense of the word, arose for centuries. No man, that is, capable of grouping events together, of depicting the policy of a monarch, or of balancing the scales of evidence. And Malmesbury, it will be remembered, belongs to the short-lived school who struggled vainly on behalf of classical learning against the rising tide of scholasticism. Indeed, in so profound a torpor were the critical faculties buried, that no age affords more marvelous proofs of the inequalities of the human mind, and of the force which the current of circumstances possesses to determine the direction of its action. How wonderful, for example, does it appear that the intellect which penned the Summa of Aquinas should have accepted the forged decretals. Here again, as in every other point, the explanation of the peculiar character of the Middle Ages is to be read, in a great measure, in the position which they occupy in history. The immediate past was, at least to the eleventh century, dreary and dark enough. The ulterior past was the source of a body of truth to be received with unquestioning reverence. There was nothing, therefore, in the past to attract the activity of the intellect. And yet we should be wrong to suppose that the past was a blank to the mind of the Middle Ages. Where the critical faculties lie dormant, a priori reasoning grows with a rank luxuriance, until it is hard to say where the realm of reason ends and the realm of fancy begins. The same habit of mind which made the theologian inevitably a realist peopled the past with legend or with forgery, expressive of the imaginary antecedents of the existing state of society. The ecclesiastical school of Cluny finds its counterpart in the forged decretals, the bloom of early chivalry in the legends of King Arthur and of Charlemagne. But the attitude of theologian and of poet alike towards the past is one not of criticism, but of tranquil homage. And wherever the serious activity of the intellect or the deeper emotion of the heart is concerned, the eye of the Middle Ages is bent intensely forward, and hence in great part the unequaled power which abstract principles then possessed to sway the course both of individuals and of nations. Hence the fervor with which a new impulse spread from class to class and from land to land. Hence also, no less, the exquisite sense of beauty and the instinctive eye for proportion, which seem so often to be found in harmony with simplicity and definiteness of aim. Hence, again, the peculiar fascination which the scenes of the last judgment and the circumstances of the future state possessed for religious art and feeling. Hence, lastly, and above all, the absorbing unity of purpose, the glorious completeness of self-sacrifice, with which men, whose hearts the Spirit of God had touched, threw themselves at once and forever into his service. Doubtless in all this, in the thought, the art, the religion of the Middle Ages, there is something which to us seems narrow. And it is narrow precisely because it looks only to the future, and to that future as seen through the vista of feudal society. Yet, on the other hand, let us remember that something of narrowness is an almost inevitable condition of that concentration of thought and purpose by which the highest victories of humanity have been achieved. And most of all is this true of the efforts of an infant civilization. In this, at least, the much-abused parallel between human society and the individual mind holds good that unless its earlier efforts be directed into some special and somewhat narrow channel, it will be apt to waste its scattered energies and to develop a feeble manhood. Every remarkable advance of human society has, in effect, been made under such special conditions, and to understand in each case the true nature and bearing of the conditions is of no mean value for the intelligent study of history. End of Part 2 End of Scholasticism, a lecture delivered before the University of Oxford, by Walter Waddington Shirley.